Amen. We're glad you're here this morning. Thanks for coming. Lots of visitors this morning. Lots of first timers. If you'll do us a favor, fill out that visitor's card in the back of the seat in front of you. We would really appreciate that. I want to live to see tomorrow, so I need to make an announcement about the ladies' brunch Saturday at 10. <laughs> I think I'll make it through the week. All right. Seriously, it's going to be a great time of fellowship. Ladies' brunch this Saturday at 10. And a couple of other things. There's two receptacles in the back of our sanctuary. One is for uh, coats for children of the Navajo Nation. They're in need of winter coats for children. Probably all sizes. Don't worry about the size. They're asking for new or gently used coats. Clean. We want them clean before they come here. But that receptacle is right back there. Great cause you might want to participate in. And then the next receptacle next to that are the future business leaders of Pagosa. It's a group at the high school, and they're collecting toys. Okay? Did you get a bulletin when you came in? What? Can you imagine a Baptist without a bulletin? Good grief. There is no such thing. You've got to have a bulletin to be a Baptist, I guess. All, all kinds of information in here, and you'll want to look through that. I want to bring your attention to a couple of things, if I may. That's that insert of uh, together. This is so important because today is the official kickoff of our missions emphasis for the year. All of December, all of January, we emphasize missions. And today, we start the week of prayer for international missions. This is so close to our hearts. Becky and I were international missionaries for 27 years. So you supported us for 27 years. And this offering we're going to take goes 100% to missions through the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention. All right, so you don't have any doubt who's keeping a percentage, where it's going. It's all going to the mission field, and it's 50% of next year's budget. I'm going to talk more about the offering <clears throat> next Sunday, but this is a prayer guide, and we are going to participate in this prayer guide. There's something to pray for every day. This is the uh, prayer guide, and also... We're going to meet together and pray as a body of Christ. Today we're going to pray about missions. Uh, you'll see the schedule there. This will be <clears throat> all during this week, and you'll want to participate in that. If you have any questions, you can call me or my wife at the office to talk about, well, what is this and, and what's it for, okay? We're going to stand up and greet each other in just a second, and then we're going to see a video, and then we're going to pray for missions. Hey, let's stand up and say hi to each other. Continue this conversation after church, either in the lobby or take somebody out to lunch. Hey, let's watch this day one video of our week of prayer for international missions. We all lead busy lives, but if we could just stop everything and take a bird's eye view, a little higher, there, now we can see the multitudes. We are fueled by a shared vision to bring the name of Christ to those who have yet to hear. So we move forward to extreme places, 
corners of the world that have no access to the gospel. We train missionaries, send them out together, and pray that God's grace be known. We help the hurting, comfort the dying, give hope to the displaced, and have seen thousands come to faith in Christ. We are able to do so much more together than if we were chasing this vision alone. This is our common effort, together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you love this world. You love every creature that you have made. And your desire that every creature that you have made spends eternity with you in heaven. Lord, in your infinite wisdom, for some reason, you have decided that we will participate in the evangelism of the globe. So we pray for wisdom. We pray for a giving heart. We pray for an attitude of going and praying and giving. And may we be a mission-minded church. That is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with us as we sing.
everything 
think the beyond comprehension came into this world, set foot on this ground, were our human flesh and worse, our sin. So that we could set foot in heaven. I pray that that would just amaze every single day. In your name I pray, amen. you guys know, if you know who I am, I'm the worship pastor. My name's Bart Mitchell. I probably do this about once a year, so forgive my nervousness, okay? Pastor John and uh, Marlene are actually in Hawaii right now, taking some time off, but also 
there to serve their son Johnny and daughter-in-law Carrie Beth as they are expecting their fourth son, our fourth child. We don't know if it's a son or a daughter yet, but let's be in prayer for that. Let's bless our time today. Let's go to the word of prayer. Father God, Lord, we pray more than anything that this morning is about you. We've just had some incredible, incredible worship, Lord, where you were honored. And I ask now that your Holy Spirit lead me in guiding your people, in guiding this wonderful, beautiful family to an understanding of true and authentic worship. Lord, be with us during this time and bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. So as always, it's an honor to get to speak to you guys today. And I am going to speak to you about worship. It's what I believe God has called me to do here at Center Point. I was just thinking about how long I've been here. And if you can believe it, January will be 10 years that I've been leading worship here. And uh, it still brings joy to my heart. And like I've told you guys before, when you are serving the Lord and doing what you love, man, there's nothing better. As we talk about uh, worship this morning, the key words that I want you to remember are becoming God's true worshipers. Each and every Sunday we get to come here because of the free country and the sacrifices, by the way, that have been done, and we get to worship our God. And what I'd like to ask you today, not through guilt, not through anything that Satan may try to put on you, but only between you and God, I'd like you to earnestly ask yourself these three questions, okay? Guilt is not allowed here this morning. That's not what this is about. I equally struggle with you guys when I ask myself these three questions, and that I have to lead you every Sunday, okay? Here they are. Number one, do you ever have a hard time drawing near to the Lord in worship and feeling his presence? If you do, how often? All the time, sometimes, or you're able to come here and really feel God's presence in worship, no matter what's being played, no matter what's happening. And I'm not just talking about the singing. But I am focusing this talk just on Sunday mornings. Worship, as you guys know, is a huge, huge topic. Question number two, why don't we, why don't I, choose more often to instead worship God consistently and with passion and with no thought of what I might receive from the Lord? Do you see the difference in those two? One is, I come with the expectancy for God or the worship leader or the pastor that's preaching to help me feel close to God. The other is a decision. I've decided to come to God and give to him my worship. And when we get to the definition of worship, that's what I want you to take away from this, okay? It's giving. The third question, why aren't we sometimes more excited about coming to church and worshiping God? No guilt. But honestly, think about that in your own life. How many times do you come on a Sunday morning and you don't come with an expectancy and excitement to worship God? You know, we get excited about other things in our lives, don't we? You know, recently I bought an RV. It took them six months to make it. And for six months, I can't tell you how many hours I spent looking on YouTube how to install solar panels and how to do solar chargers and the radio. Oh, the radio's not very good. I got to figure out something about the speakers and because we like to watch movies and all of this time and energy and excitement. I was so excited to get it. We went camping twice. It snowed. It sits behind my yard and it just sits there now. I can't go out. How about a new car? How about your favorite football team? We paint our faces. We know the stats. We get excited. Go Broncos? Anybody? Oh, come on. You're not buying into it. 
We get excited about all sorts of things. Without guilt, ask yourself, how often, honestly now, am I excited about coming on a Sunday morning to worship a God that loves you, that died for you? You see, we have to put things in proper perspective. Jesus talks about in John 4, 23 and 24, about worshiping God in spirit and truth. If we're going to be able to do that, then what is required? We can't come to worship our God on a Sunday morning expecting others or our outside environment to lead us into the presence of God. That's what we call being externally motivated. Okay? God does not want that from us. If we are coming to listen to a specific type of music, whether it be contemporary or hymns or whatever it is, that is not what God expects of you in his worship. If we are coming to look at the lights, and it's beautiful, (laughs) I love it, but that is not what God requires of us to worship him. It's not about how loud the music is or how soft the music is. It's not about the people around you that may be distracting you. What is it about? It's about worshiping in spirit and in truth. Why is it that we can't come on a Sunday morning when it happens and not be excited about worshiping God? It's because of those external things that we've been talking about. God wants us to be internally motivated. And I wanna talk to you now for the rest of this time about what that means. When we talk about that, we've got to first look at the definition of worship in the Bible. And by the way, I read John MacArthur's book on worship, the ultimate uh, something, I can't remember what it's called, but it's an incredible book. And a lot of what I am giving you today, what does it say? The ultimate priority. A lot of the quotes that I'm going to give you today come from that book because they express from me in my heart what I want you to know and what I believe God wants you to take from this morning in regards to how he wants us to worship, okay? So if, when I'm reading these quotes, please forgive me. This is not what I normally do. I sing. And can you beat Dr. MacArthur in what he's, I mean, no, okay? So why not just read, you know, what he says? So if it sounds intelligent, it's not from me, okay? <laughs> Two main words in the Bible that describe worship, proskuneo, a commonly used term that literally means to bow down. It's the word for worship used to signify humble adoration. The second word is letruo. It means to serve, which suggests rendering honor, paying homage or service to others. Both of these terms, I want you to know, come with the word giving. We come to give. We don't come to receive and worship to God, okay? Here's what MacArthur says about the definition of worship. Genuine worship is a response to divine truth. It is passionate because it arises out of our love for God and what he did for us. But to be a true worshiper, it must also arise out of a correct understanding of his law, his righteousness, his mercy, and his being. Real worship acknowledges God as he has revealed himself in his word. Amen? Amen. So now that we know what it means, let's talk about Jesus. When he was speaking to the woman at the well, John 4, 23, 24, Jesus says, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Let's break those words down. What does it mean by worshiping in spirit? It's small s, not big S. It means to worship from the heart. 
The word and spirit is the human spirit, the inner person, the heart. Worship is to flow from the inside out. How do we do that? How do we worship God in spirit? Number one, MacArthur says we've got to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. How do we yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit? Number one is we must be saved. If we don't know and have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if we don't understand what he did for us in our sin, that he died on the cross, that he was risen three days later, we cannot know Jesus. We cannot know his lordship, and we cannot submit to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is not in us. And if you have come today and you don't believe in your heart, with all of your heart, that Jesus Christ died for you, and you do not know what that means, please come talk to me after the service. I would love to talk to you about that and how much Jesus loves you, how he is willing to forgive you if you would believe and repent and turn away from those things that you were doing wrong, that you know in your heart are not right. Number two, once we have that relationship, we must decide to yield to the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5, 18 and 20, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. First is being filled, submitting to the Lord's Holy Spirit. Then comes the singing and the worshiping of God. Secondly, our thoughts must be centered. We must come here having prepared during the week and having our hearts and our minds centered on God. Otherwise, we come externally motivated. Does that make sense? If we don't spend time with God during the week and we're not building our relationship with him, how can we properly worship him from the heart? We all know what happens when we don't spend time with God every day. What do we do? We react from our flesh because it's strong. And if we don't submit to the Holy Spirit and the reading of his word, if we don't spend time with God and prepare our hearts all week, then we cannot expect to worship God from the Spirit. MacArthur says, our worship should be the overflow of our minds renewed by God's word, the overflow of time spent with him in prayer and discovery of who he is. It's only in having a deep, loving relationship with him, in realizing what he has done for you and how much he loves you, that we are able to come and give from our hearts in worship. That takes time. You know, we are busy, 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 aren't we? We are bombarded with media and texting on our phones and all of the different things that happen. We're busy in our jobs. How often do we think about in the week? How often do you think about in the week? Honestly, earnestly getting on your knees and spending time with God and his word and then worshiping him, developing that relationship Men, before you married your wives, how much time did you spend with them? Just one hour a month, really, that's all I could do? No. Every waking moment that you had free, you would spend with your wives. It's the same thing here. God loves each and every one of you way more than you can ever discover in a lifetime of study of his word. But if you want to come and be prepared, if you want to honor God and know that you're coming before a holy God in worship, then you've got to spend time with him during the week, okay? Let's vow to do that. David provides a wonderful example in Psalms. There's tons and tons of wonderful things, but one of my favorites is Psalm 63, 1 through 4. Listen to his heart. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory. 
because your steadfast love is better than life. It's better than my RV. It's better than your car. It's better than the Broncos. It's better than whatever you may be excited about. It's better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift my hands. Can you hear his heart? Can you hear his devotion and his love to God? It's beautiful. Thirdly, if we're going to worship in the spirit, we must have a repentant heart. We must have a heart that realizes the sin that we have done. And in that, we decide to turn away from that and to turn towards God, to change, to grow, and to worship him with a repentant heart. I'm going to show you just a little clip from The Chosen. You've seen this before. But this time, it's about Jesus and the woman at the well. But this time, I want you to focus and look at it in terms of worship. Kathy, can we play that? Yeah. 
Do you know how much Jesus loves you? If you're here today, maybe you're a believer, maybe you're not, but you need to know that you serve a God who loves you no matter what you've done. All you need to do is to ask him to forgive you, to earnestly turn away from that sin. And if you have done that, when was the last time that you celebrated like you saw the woman at the well celebrating? When we worship God and we come with a heart that is repentant, we come with a heart that knows that without Jesus Christ in my life, I would be nothing. When we come with that kind of a heart, a grateful heart, a thankful heart that is so excited that God has forgiven me of what I've done. Wow. I can worship. Amen. We can worship, but we've got to spend time getting grounded and remembering ourselves because there's so many things that are coming at us during the week. Everyone needs our attention, all these different things. And if we can't stop and focus and find a time during the day where we can spend time just worshiping God and realizing what he's done, then we will not be able to come here on Sunday mornings and truly worship him from the heart. There's one more thing I want to cover with you in regards to spirit and worshiping in spirit. And it has to do with what we just talked about. And that is the one big hindrance to us being able to come to church and doing that is guess what? It's me. It's us. It's when we allow ourselves and our selfishness to get in the way. And again, I'm going to read to you what MacArthur says because it's really good. It can come in all kinds of packages, but the result is the same. When we put ourselves in front of God, we cannot worship him properly. 
We can blame it on a lack of time or too many distractions. But we find the time to do the projects and activities that we generally want to do, don't we? It's like the old saying we've always heard. If you want to find out what somebody loves, look at where they spend their money. The real problem with the one who uses those excuses, that's me, is that I'm too selfish, too lazy, too self-indulgent to align my priorities properly. I love what Stephen Charnock wrote, again from MacArthur's book, to pretend homage to God and intend only the advantage of self is rather to mock God than worship Him. When we believe that we ought to be satisfied rather than God glorified, we set God below ourselves. We imagine that He should submit His own honor to our advantage. We make ourselves more glorious than God. That's the chief hindrance to worshiping in spirit, to set oneself, one's needs, one's desires, one's advantages, and one's desire for blessings above God. Wow. That one hurts. What does it mean to worship God in truth? That's the second half of what Jesus said. And MacArthur again, worship is not merely an emotional exercise with God words or musical sounds that induce certain feelings. Worship is certainly not a mystical, I had to ask Marcy what this word was, catharsis of human passion detached from any rational thought or biblical precept. True worship is a response of adoration and praise prompted by the truth that God has revealed. Psalm 86, 11, teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth, unite my heart to fear your name. That's David again. How do I worship in truth? First, through personal study again, just like when we talked in spirit. If you can imagine a triangle with me, the Holy Spirit is at the top. Dwelling richly in God's word is on this side. My faith in Christ is at the bottom, and my spirit is, My heart is on the right side. To truly worship God, we need the Holy Spirit. That worship comes by the study of God's word and by the Holy Spirit being us submitting to him. So personal time with God, Colossians 3.16 now. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Again, doing what? When the word of Christ dwells in us richly, when we spend time with the Lord and his truth and his word, teaching and admonishing one another on Sundays, we can then sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We can worship God in truth. How do we let the word of Christ dwell in us richly? We begin by spending time in his word, and then secondly, by submitting to the Holy Spirit in the study of God's Word. And if you are not prioritizing God during the week for the eight millionth time, you can't expect to come here and feel God's presence. You can't expect to come here and honor God and His glory and His holiness with the proper heart and respect for the God that you are trying to worship. If our worship is the fire, this was another author, but I loved it, so I had to give this to you. If our worship is the fire, then God's truth is the fuel that causes our fire to burn. Boy, I love that. The more the fuel, the hotter the fire. And then secondly, we worship God in truth by learning through the preaching of God's word on Sundays. And this is, again, MacArthur's quote, because I can't say this any better, but it is so good. Watch, follow with me here now, okay? MacArthur says this, why, some may wonder, is there such an emphasis on preaching in the worship service? Why not just have a brief message, or even no message at all, just sing songs, pray, praise, and have testimonies? To ask the question is to reveal the ignorance about the reason for and the nature of the pastor-teacher's task. The challenge of the pulpit is to bring the people to the place of worship 
as a way of life. Amen to that. In between two worlds, John Stott says it well. Word and worship belong inseparably to each other. All worship is an intelligent and loving response to the revelation of God because it is the adoration of his name. Therefore, acceptable worship is impossible without preaching, for preaching is making known the name of the Lord, and worship is praising the name of the Lord made known. Far from being an alien intrusion into worship, the reading and preaching of the word are actually indispensable to it. The two cannot be divorced. Indeed, it is their unnatural divorce which accounts for the low level of so much contemporary worship. Our worship is poor because our knowledge of God is poor. And our knowledge of God is poor because our preaching is poor. Let me just say right now, I am grateful to God every day that we have a pastor here, Pastor John, who fearlessly is willing to speak God's word. Amen? Amen. Amen. But when the word of God is expounded in its fullness and the congregation begin to glimpse the glory of the living God, they can bow down in solemn awe and joyful wonder before his throne. It is preaching which accomplishes this, the proclamation of the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit of God. That is why preaching is unique and irreplaceable. The powerful exposition of the word then is essential to the meaningful worship in the assembly of the saints. And the insight gained into God's word in the worship service will both deepen the quality of individual worship throughout the week and stimulate the saints' desire to study the scriptures daily. Amen? So what is true worship? It's worshiping in spirit and truth. How do we accomplish that? We decide that we serve a God who loves us so much that we are willing to spend time with him and his word and allow his Holy Spirit to work in us the right kind of heart that we need so that we come here on Sunday mornings, we are prepared. We're not looking for anything outside of us to to help us feel close to God. We come here willing and ready to celebrate from a week of worship with our God. Amen? Amen? Let's decide to do that today. Let's decide to honor God and his holiness and start treating our worship more seriously from the heart. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I thank you for this time with you this morning and for what your word says about true, authentic worshipers. Lord, we want to honor and glory you in every aspect of our Sunday worship. So Lord God, I ask now that through your Holy Spirit and through the willingness of our spirit that you would work in and through us. That Lord God, we would be able to come here and put a smile on your face because you see your children loving you, worshiping you, but knowing from your truth that we serve a holy God and that we take it seriously. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're a visitor here today, please know we have some things outside. If you want to figure, uh, fill out a visitor's card and you'd like to know more information about Centerpoint Church, please do that. Please come and talk to me if you need any prayer or if you have any questions at all about the family of Centerpoint. God bless you. Have a great week.